thank you all very much for joining us this morning. My name is Clark Miller, and I am the director of the Center for Energy and Society at Arizona State University. And I'm delighted to be able to welcome you here today for our webinar uh, on Cities of Light. This uh, is both a celebration uh, of the release of a, an exciting new book with the title Cities of Light uh, that is a part of a collaboration between uh, the Center for Science and the Imagination uh, at Arizona State University, the Center for Energy and Society, and the National Renewable Energy Lab uh, Center for the Sciences of Mobility. And uh, or integrated mobility sciences, I think, is the official title. And um, uh, at the same time, it's an important conversation about uh, the future of the urban landscape, uh, the future of urban energy systems, and the future of urban social justice, uh, and how they intersect with each other, uh, and what kinds of opportunities we have as, uh, uh, as cities, uh, as countries, uh, and frankly, as the world, uh, to leverage the coming energy transition uh, to do good in the world. Uh, we um, uh, live in a world that is increasingly beset by climate change uh, and in which uh, increasingly, the centers of power in the world, including uh, in uh, the political capitals of our countries, uh, the diplomatic negotiations uh, of the international community, uh, and the boardrooms of the energy sector, the financial sector, and the transportation sector, we see decisions being made every day. Uh, to commit to a world of uh, zero carbon emissions or zero net carbon emissions into the atmosphere, uh, to try to tackle climate change, limit its damage over the next several decades, uh, so that by mid-century, we, at least as a, as a species, are no longer driving transformations uh, in uh, the global climate. Uh, that transition will happen largely, not exclusively, but largely in the energy sector, where energy includes both electricity and transportation. Uh, and one of the fundamental questions uh, that we're interested in is what are the design opportunities, the design possibilities uh, for leveraging that transition? Uh, in other words, it turns out there are lots of different ways uh, that you can get to zero emissions of carbon dioxide. And uh, those ways matter for how uh, the world of 2050 and the world after 2050 are organized uh, socially, politically, economically, as well as technologically, geographically, ecologically, right? And so uh, we're, we're increasingly interested at the Center for Energy and Society in how, uh, what are those options? What are those different futures that we might uh, imagine and move towards and try to accomplish? Uh, what are the trade-offs among them? What are the, the kinds of choices that we have? And how can we create materials that allow us, uh, and not just us in the academy or in the expert community or in the policy community, but really people of, uh, of all uh, communities around the world allow us collectively uh, to explore those different potential futures uh, and to um, evaluate uh, what they might mean for us as individuals, as households, as communities, as neighborhoods, as cities, uh, and, and make uh, somewhat informed choices uh, about how to try to move forward uh, uh, in the context, of course, of these uh, different kinds of institutional arrangements, uh, our governance systems, our, our uh, market systems, and how those institutions make different kinds of choices. And one of the things that we've been particularly focused on 
uh, in this regard is the role of solar energy in those futures. <clears throat> We've been focused on solar for a couple of different reasons. One of those is that um, many people, when they project out the future energy systems that we will need to build in order to get to zero carbon emissions, uh, they highlight the uh, centrality of solar energy to those futures. Uh, and you can see lots of projections that suggest that essentially solar will replace oil as the dominant form of uh, energy supply, primary energy supply uh, for the planet as a whole. Uh, and that photovoltaics in particular may ultimately uh, create half or even more of the world's primary energy supply. Obviously there are gonna be many other forms of energy that are part of that uh, future mix. We may have uh, hydrogen, we, we certainly will have lots of wind power. Uh, we are likely to have some, uh, if not a lot of nuclear power. Um, but when it comes to sort of the, the uh, low cost options uh, and the clean kind of options for future energy supply, a lot of it is gonna have to come from uh, the sun and capturing photons and turning them into electricity. The second reason we're focused on solar is because it's an unbelievably flexible technology. Right now in actual markets uh, that are uh, even unregulated markets uh, around the world, we see solar energy being deployed on the scale of watts, like, uh, like small solar lanterns, for example, which are incredibly popular in a variety of different markets. It's actually a multi-billion dollar market already solar powered lanterns uh, and actually several multi-billion dollar markets uh, of different kinds uh, and in different parts of the world, uh, all the way up to gigawatts, right? So large utility scale solar uh, installations being designed and deployed uh, in places around the world. So nine orders of magnitude uh, of flexibility in terms of the scale of deployment of solar energy. And at the same time, we see amazing flexibility already in terms of the ways in which we weave solar panels into our geographic landscapes, uh, into our socioeconomic uh, fabrics of our societies. We have different ownership uh, practices, different governance regimes, uh, all of which work for diff in different ways for different people. Um, with different kinds of distributions of costs and benefits. And so when I say that we have choices, I really mean uh, that we have some amazing choices about the different ways that we might deploy out solar energy. And especially for the topic of this uh, work, cities. Cities are kind of the centerpiece of the climate challenge. They are where most of humanity now lives. They are where most of the world's energy consumption uh, occurs. They are where uh, we have concentrations of transportation systems, concentrations of industrial systems. And so solving the energy challenge for cities is a kind of fundamental piece of the puzzle. And, uh, and we already see very different approaches uh, from cities that are uh, encouraging distributed solar, rooftop solar systems across um, houses, cities like Minneapolis that are encouraging community scale solar development uh, uh, in neighborhoods and, and in parts of the city, uh, uh, cities that are encouraging commercial uh, operations, big box retailers to put solar on their rooftops. And of course we see other cities that are encouraging large scale utility far, solar farms to be developed in the geographies around them uh, with the electricity coming in by a transmission line. So we, re we really see these choices uh, in already in how cities are approaching thinking about the future of solar energy. And so when we had the opportunity to work with uh, the National Renewable Energy Lab to uh, undertake uh, a, a collaborative uh, project 
to leverage the power of science fiction, the power of creativity and art, uh, the power of interdisciplinary uh, expert synthesis and integration to kind of think about what some of those different possible futures might look like and especially how they might play out for different kinds of people who inhabit both cities and the, uh, the suburban and exurban and rural landscapes that surround cities. Uh, we were delighted to take advantage of that opportunity. And today's webinar uh, is an opportunity for a number of the key participants in that process uh, to um, uh, have a chance to share with you their insights, their ideas, uh, their uh, work from this project. Uh, and so what I want to do is just give each of them an opportunity here to uh, speak for uh, five minutes or so and, and talk about what they found most meaningful and exciting uh, about the project. And then we'll uh, open it up into a more general conversation across the panel and with all of you. So thank you so much uh, again for attending. Um, I'm going to ask uh, SB Divya first to, uh, to speak with us. She's an award-winning science fiction author. Her new novel, Machinehood, is just hot off the press uh, and a really exciting forward-looking uh, uh, exploration of, of the future of artificial life and artificial intelligence. So Divya, thanks so much for joining us here today and, and uh, welcome to the panel. Thank you so much for having me here, Clark. Um, I'll dive right in and say I was very privileged to be able to write a short story for Cities of Light and had a fantastic time at this collaborative event a year ago, just before everything shut down for the pandemic. So it was a, it was a very treasured memory and experience. And the outcome of it was a short story called Things That Bend But Don't Break set in the city of San Juan on the island of Puerto Rico. And the main character, Tanama, is a young woman dealing with some decisions in her life about her future. And one of the things we decided to do with this story is include her, her mother and her grandmother's experiences with a solar powered Puerto Rico and also these sorts of personal decisions about um, her life, her education, the way they live, the way they earn money, their independence or dependence on the government. And I believe that it's really important in stories to show generational change. One of the things that a lot of science fiction doesn't always get into is showing how we arrive at a particular future from where we are today. And I think there's a way to do that through family. Um, you know, we all come from multiple generations of family. There's older people, younger people, there's looking back and looking forward. And that provides a way to kind of show this transformation that we can make, right? How do we get to a positive tomorrow? And I love telling optimistic science fiction stories. Um, in addition to being a writer, I'm also the co-editor of a weekly science fiction podcast called Escape Pod. And my co-editor, Mer Lafferty, and myself are strong believers in stories that always have a ray of hope in them. And I bring this mandate in with me and you know, all the stories I tell, even if they go very dark places, I wanna make sure that there is an opportunity for the characters and for the readers to experience hope. And this particular story is hope and optimism, you know, for the people of Puerto Rico and for all of us in terms of driving technological change hand in hand with social change. And I think the, the power of the story or fiction is you know this idea that seeing is believing, right? Human beings sometimes have a hard time envisioning what's possible until you know they have a depiction of it that they can understand, a single character or a few characters through whose eyes 
They can really experience what life is like. So with this particular short story, that's what I tried to do, you know, this is not an extraordinary character. She's not, you know, a queen or a president. She's an ordinary young woman about to go to college, having a girlfriend, um, dealing with her elderly grandmother, you know, and her mom. And these are very uh, grounded and I hope relatable experiences for everyone. But you can see through her eyes, you know, what's possible, right? And how life has transformed um, between her grandmother's generation and her own, how she's going to make choices that are perhaps different from the way people would make choices today. And that shows, I think, really the social impact, the possibilities of um, these sorts of energy efficient, clean new futures, how they can empower individuals and keeps the focus as much on the people as on the technology. There is a lot of shiny, fun, cool technology in this story too, because um, that's one of my favorite aspects of writing science fiction is to research you know, the edge of possibility and carry that forward into how it can become integrated with our everyday lives. But sometimes stories tend to focus too much on like the cool factor and not enough on that impact on daily living and the environment and how it all sort of weaves together. And I think one of my favorite aspects of this particular story and experience was the integrated nature of how we developed it as well. Because it was me, it was, you know, Reagan, uh, who was our artist. It was uh, Gia and Josh and Andrew, who are our subject matter experts. And all of us discussed, you know, the, the, both the practical aspects of the solar future, the types of technological installations there could be in this world, but also these individuals for whom it might have a positive impact on their lives. And um, thank you so much to, to Clark and Joey and Ruth uh, for inviting me to be part of this project. I, I really loved it. And I hope all of you really enjoy reading the story. Thanks, Divya. You know, one of the things I like about uh, things that bend but don't break, uh, especially from our kind of point of view is that there's a lot of talk um, these days about the idea of energy sovereignty, um, uh, especially for smaller communities and groups and the idea that we might um, uh, take a little bit more ownership over the kinds of energy arrangements uh, that we develop and that that might also be linked to uh, trying to create a little more economic justice in the world. And uh, I think the story really does a, a great job of exploring kind of both the opportunities and the struggles of trying to figure out how to do that uh, in, in, you know, when you're a small group of people that wants to, to try to, try to um, take their own path, so to speak. So thank you again for participating in the project and, and for sharing this morning. Um, uh, Next, let me introduce uh, Patty romero Lancao, our uh, kind of uh, um, partner at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory and a senior researcher there, as well as at the Manquedo Institute uh, at the University of Chicago. She's an urban sociologist who's been working on uh, climate change and energy uh, issues for a very, very long time and just has a, an amazing, a set of perspectives on what it's like to think about and 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 inhabit cities uh, from the ground up. So, uh, Patty. Oh, thank you so much, uh, and thank you everyone for for this uh, opportunity to share some ideas with you. Um, I mean, for me, this global transition to zero carbon and resilient societies is is as constrained by social injustice and inequality as it is by technological or physical limits, such as those posed by climate change. As already indicated by Clark, cities are key, not only because they are source of the problem, right? 
uh, cities generate about 75% uh, of uh, global uh, 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 emissions. And they are also vulnerable to power disruptions uh, as many cases that we are aware of, such as wildfires, hurricanes have demonstrated. And cities and city actors are fundamental in advancing many of the sustainable development goals, for instance, uh, for affordable, reliable, and sustainable energy services, for uh, climate action, and for inclusive urban resiliency. The problem is that, as we already know, it, all the innovations, including solar, that are available only to the wealthy, that nurture popular resentment and resistance, or that reproduce or exacerbate inequalities are unlikely to be sustainable by any political, socioeconomic, cultural, or environmental metric. So there are already calls to consider equity and justice in these uh, transitions, but we really don't know a lot about how to really make sure that these new technologies such as solar are assessed and utilized by minority, poor, and working class people. So what I really, really like about engaging in this exercise is that having grown in Mexico City and having done a lot of work with communities, indigenous communities there, I learned that there is a huge power in narrative. It's the power we have to ambition what is happening and how to take a crack at solving it. So uh, for me, the experiment of engaging with these amazing uh, writers to, to, to really see the world through their lens and to add a little bit of insights from what we all know in different areas was an exper experiment that I really think also shake my lab because I noticed that everyone was like, wow, this is great. How can we connect what we know with these stories, et cetera? So in short, I, I really think that we need to engage not only with a scientific understanding of what the problem is, but also with a, a kind of framing that is available to everyone. And in that, our experiment was really crucial. And I really enjoyed reading and also being challenged to write my little essay in which I really just um, try to make the point that when we, when trying to affect change, we mostly focus on uh, mobilizations that are open, that are like the big ones, you know, the, the ones, uh, the march, for instance, the, the Life, Matter, uh, Life Matters March is key. But we need to also engage with day-to-day -day conversations with people who do not necessarily want to speak loud and in public, who prefer to have a more intimate approach to sharing their feelings, their fears, their expectations for the future. And I think that, and, and, and again, by, by, by uh, engaging in our solar shades uh, uh, story, I mean, we, we're just reading and informing a little bit to the writing of it by Andrew, we really were able to, I was able to say, hey, we need to also engage with the struggles of people on the ground, with their sense of identity, with their fears, with uh, sometimes just the, their basic and very human needs to pursue their lives with dignity. So I really, really enjoy engaging in this. And I think that for us to be able to create capacities, enhance capacities or fight for capacities. We need to come together with artists, with writers, with cooks. Believe me, a good party with good food can facilitate a lot of stuff. I know it because I'm from Mexico. Or just dancing, like we need to engage with different ways of thinking of the world, feeling the world, and thinking of what we expect for the future. Only by so doing, we will be able perhaps not to change the world, but to learn how to navigate it and how to live it in a better and more uh, connected way. So I, I, again, thank you for allowing me to be part of this experiment. And I'm sure this is the beginning of a very good journey. And I invite everyone in this group, but also in the broader group of participants in this dialogue to engage with us. 
Thanks, Patty. I, I'm reminded that uh, the recent uh, National Academies report, uh, Accelerating Decarbonization of the U.S. Energy Sector, uh, emphasized pretty strongly that uh, there's a, a robust need uh, at all levels, uh, from localities to states to the federal government, um, to uh, develop a, a comprehensive approach to trying to build a social contract for decarbonization and the kind of diverse uh, approach to thinking about uh, how do we engage people uh, in fun ways in their lives, everyday lives, uh, uh, it, who aren't ordinarily thinking about energy and climate and, and those things and how important that uh, agenda is. So thank you for for emphasizing that. And I really hope that uh, in our uh, next set of discussions on that committee that we can, uh, we can be as creative as you are already thinking uh, about how we approach that question of engaging the American uh, people in this conversation about decarbonization. So uh, thanks for that. Uh, let me turn next to Angel. Angel Echeverria is a PhD student uh, at Arizona State University here in the Center for Energy and Society, and he's part of a collaborative project that we have also with uh, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory and with the University of Puerto Rico in Mayaguez uh, to work with communities on uh, grassroots energy innovation uh, in rural Puerto Rico uh, and was part of the team with Patty uh, and Andrew around the story Solar Shades in the book. So, uh, and Angel, please. Um, thank you, Clark, for introducing me, and thank you, everyone who attended uh, here today, and um, also for this great team uh, that I was able to uh, collaborate with. I learned a lot. Um, and this, uh, for me, was a really powerful uh, and learning experience uh, for many reasons. Uh, the first one uh, was the environment, uh, being able to, uh, to be there with uh, different people, different uh, perspectives, but also in the facilities at NREL's uh, campus, uh, which we had a tour. It was uh, very stimulating uh, to me and all the conversations we have in the, in the, in the hackathon. So, my story, uh, I work, uh, my story was based on, on, on this uh, kid, this met uh, coming from an informal setting. Uh, and that put, put uh, which is uh, one of the main characters of, of the stories of Solar Shade, I put him into track to, to to sense and to experience uh, many uh, issues and aspects that not everyone uh, experienced. Uh, for example, uh, he, he suffered uh, uh, scarcity of, of electricity, he had uh, outages, he, saw, he, he was able to uh, get into contact with an advanced and technological device uh, in, the, in the shape of, uh, of sunglasses. Uh, and that allowed him to, to see different aspects of the energy systems, uh, just as we uh, scientists do. And me being a, a, a student, engaging with different theories and frameworks uh, and dealing with energy, uh, energy transition, uh, also drawing from my uh, personal experience here on the island, which uh, we have uh, many struggles uh, with the electricity uh, system and in transportation overall. So all that combined uh, into, into an idea that I, that I had to also let myself uh, be sensible to, to everything. And, uh, and that's when, when the idea of the encounter came is that when you start to sensibilize to, to let's say a solar panel 
and you say, well, what, what's what's embedded in there? Uh, what what it, what it is in there with this solar panel that, that I cannot see uh, here uh, from where I am in front of it, uh, maybe. Uh, but what it takes uh, for that panel to to be here, uh, and then uh, I started engaging in, in all uh, those questions. Well, uh, there is a lot of uh, industry, is uh, a lot. Lots of people that have to do stuff to go work every day, get the materials, the policy, the regulation, the standardization, the utilities, the economic models, everything. So, so there is there is uh, lots of things to that we need to think about uh, when we are uh, talking about the transformation of the energy uh, sector, uh, because all of that. Uh, is configured, is designed in different ways and shapes, and that have a, a, a lot of implications in, into our lives. Uh, and we, we normally don't, don't, don't uh, stop to think about that, but, but when you do uh, start engaging uh, with this, uh, and that's what I call the encounter, uh, when you just stop, uh, you stop for a moment and, and, and relate to this, uh, Take them, take the time to to put the, the thought, feelings, and emotions, and everything. Uh, then you will start uh, seeing a, a whole different world, uh, just like uh, Kismet, uh, the person, the, the the character that, that when he put the, the glasses, uh, he starts seeing different uh, different world, and that allows him to to uh, dare to imagine what what would be. Uh, what can be different? Uh, because the problem, well, it's not a problem, but well, it is. <laughs> but the thing that Kismet uh, confronted uh, is that there is uh, the standard uh, practice uh, of what it is, the, stand, the, the paradigms that we follow right now. Uh, and there is the imagination of what you wish to, to be out, to, to see out there. <laughs> And then, if you need to, if you want to to transform the energy system, then you need to 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 start thinking outside of those paradigms and to see what what where uh, that can lead you and in what ways and, and, and what you can learn from that. And I think that's what I try to do. I explain uh, different uh, lenses, scientific lenses, scientific uh, or, or ways of. Uh, Scientists see the energy system from engineering to like more focused approach to more holistic ones. Uh, I try to do it a simple language uh, as much as I can, because again, uh, when you put a lot of sensibility into it, there is a lot that you need to digest and, and it's difficult, uh, but I try to do my best. And, and I think it's, it's a uh, it's an essay that can help anyone that that usually think about all of this at least to start uh, thinking and knowing. Well, there is much more than just the panel in front of me. It's a lot in the back that I don't see, um, and that we need to think about and we need to transform it. So that's it. That's what I did. <laughs> I hope you like it. Thanks, Angel. That's really helpful. Um, you know, I at the Center for Energy and Society, uh, our tagline, if you will, uh, is putting people at the heart of the global energy revolution. And I really do think that um, it's critically important to uh, approach energy transitions, not just as large scale changes in technology, uh, but uh, as changes in the way, to put it in, in Angel's terms, how people encounter uh, the energy system at the same time, right? Uh, uh, from the kinds of things that the energy system provides for us, the kinds of services uh, that it provides, the kinds of things that those services enable us uh, to do, uh, to, uh, of course, a, a broad array of different ways in which uh, we encounter uh, the energy system, and uh, and so I, I this idea of Angel's that he's been uh, 
putting forward for, for some time now in his plans for his dissertation, I think is a really powerful encapsulation of the idea uh, that uh, we see energy systems, um, we interact with energy systems, uh, we um, uh, understand energy systems uh, in our daily lives and in our institutional contexts. And, uh, and it's, a, it's a really powerful tool for thinking critically about how we encounter energy systems today uh, and how we would like to uh, have people encounter energy systems uh, in the future. And I think particularly uh, when we're thinking about the, the kinds of communities that Patty was talking about in cities, uh, in, in inner city neighborhoods or in, in other low income uh, communities, their encounters with the energy system are very different, uh, I think, than, um, than those of other parts of the city. And that's worth reflecting on, uh, both for today and, and for tomorrow. So thank you, Angel, very much. Uh, let me introduce next, uh, Giamar Rivera. Matos, who is another of our uh, brilliant PhD students here in the Center for Energy and Society, and uh, also another participant in our uh, Puerto Rico collaboration. And uh, she was part of the team with Divya uh, around the things that bend but don't break story. So, Gia. Uh, thank you, Claire, for that introduction. First of all, I want to thank everyone that participated in this project. Um, this was a wonderful group of people, and I'm, I'm grateful to be part of it. And so for the project overall, I, I think it was fascinating that we had the opportunity to be in the same room, talking with science fiction authors, artists, thinkers, subject experts on different topics to generate a joint project. I think for me, that was fascinating. Um, I think for most of us, it was unexpected what we could come out of this project. So that was also very interesting, the, the flexibility that this project had and still have. And I was a little bit surprised about the outcomes of this book. I'm actually very proud of it. But um, a year ago, I like I had no idea. Well, we have an idea because we have the first book, The Weight of Life. But um, I wasn't sure about what we were going to see at the end, and, and I think it's, it's, it's great. Um, so also, I really like the methodology um, that the, the Center for Science and Imagination used to generate this outcome and help us to get there, you know, the, the authors and the thinkers and the artists. And so I... I I usually have great conversation with colleagues and friends um, that I that are often lost in, in time and there's no mechanism to actually share with others. And it was great that we had this mechanism that we can put it together. And also actually now we have this link and this book where other people all around the world can read it and can engage with us. Can and I think that that was that was great. And and I I think like also in our life as, as academics and we should try to integrate things like this in, in our conversation and in our get togethers and maybe in a more informally informal way, but still. So regarding my essay, um, I'm very glad that the editors um, allow us to include academic stuff in the science fiction book. I think that was, that was great. And, and it was not easy, as Angel said, writing that because we are writing about <laughs> the future, like in 30 years from now. So it was, and our work is informed by our realities today. So I, I, I think it was very helpful to actually have that time to write, read, and think about those future that are not that strict as academic writing is. And I think that was helpful to me, um, not just for this project, but also to me as a student, as a thinker. Um, so that was great. And so also due to, to that flexibility, I was able, I could pitch different audiences. Um, 
there's the science fiction, there's the future people, there's the academics, but also my essay particularly is focused on the young local activists in Puerto Rico. Um, and I will talk to you a little bit more about the essay in a minute, but I wanna say that because this is an essay about hope and possibilities. And because we live in a colony and a current co uh, colony, most of our time as a young people there is investing in resistant and anti-colonial projects. But there's a need, I, I, I believe there's a need to have a space for thinking about the colonial futures, thinking about our future um, sustainable, that is sustainable and understanding that technologies are very essential to build that, to build that. So this essay is also for them and I hope they will be able to read it. And as I say, it's about our future, hope, possibilities, but it's also informed by our reality, by our solidarity or big hurts as a poor and people, and, but also informed by what is not working right now, what we don't like, what we don't want. And I think that's also very informed, but the very important that it's not just, you know, um, building this future that is disjointed or disconnected from our re current realities. And, and yeah, so it's also about solar technologies. It's about cities, it's about future, it's about people, dignity. And yeah, I hope you like it. And um, yeah, I'm very happy to share it with you. Thanks, Gia. Uh, in case it wasn't obvious from that, uh, she is a passionate social activist uh, who believes uh, quite strongly in the future of Puerto Rico and uh, uh, and recognizes that that is a uh, a struggle. I, it's uh, in in um, I, I'm sure that the some of the forms of kind of alternate economic development that uh, show up in the story were influenced by Gia's interest in alternative economies uh, and the way that they can be put together. Um, so thank you, uh, Gia, for, for that and for your uh, participation uh, in the project. Uh, and also for uh, a great uh, segue to uh, Joey in talking about the methodology of the project. Uh, and so Joey Eshrich is, uh, program manager at the Center for Science and the Imagination and a uh, inveterate organizer and editor of uh, a wide range of different books now over the last several years that uh, tackle the interesting challenge of bringing uh, artists and writers and academics together um, to explore uh, possible futures and and uh, opportunities and challenges that they create. So, Joey, please. Thanks, Clark, and thanks everybody for uh, uh, all the insights you've shared so far. And as Clark said, uh, Gia, especially for for giving uh, a plug for the methodology and a, and a good segue um, into into what I'll talk about. So. Um, Clark and I co-edited this book and uh, with my colleague Ruth Wiley, who isn't, who isn't on this uh, panel, but uh, was instrumental, uh, I, I helped to organize the workshop. And of course, with all of our uh, colleagues at the National Renewable Energy Lab who provided a space and made it possible. Um, I'll talk a little bit just about the, the approach to, to putting together a book like this. So we've done a few other projects, as Clark mentioned, that, um, that have book-ish book or book-like outputs, um, uh, including our first Weight of Light book, where we brought people together and then ended up producing a collaborative volume. So we call this uh, a narrative hackathon, usually, which is just you know sort of like a fun word for a workshop and uh, meant to get at uh, the focus on stories about different possible futures. And then the focus, of course, on sort of collaboration, experimentation, um, improvisation, and sort of putting together visions of the future collectively and, and involving people from lots of different um, walks of life and people with lots of different perspectives, hopefully. So we usually do these over uh, two to three days. We try to do it in a compelling location when possible. Thankfully, uh, because of our colleagues at NREL, we were able to go to Golden, Colorado and have this workshop uh, with this beautiful mountain view uh, and, and sort of exclusive access to the, to the laboratory. And we got to go on a great tour 
uh, as Angel mentioned, and, and see the grounds and talk to many of the researchers and experts there. So uh, we gathered there for a couple of days and um, organized the participants in this book, some of whom are on this uh, panel, um, into four different uh, groups. And each group had a science fiction author, a visual artist. Uh, all the visual artists were from the, uh, the Denver, Colorado, Golden, Colorado area. Um, and they're you know, really amazing. If you check out the, the link to the book, you'll see uh, on that webpage and then the book itself, uh, really beautiful art that's really distinctive for each, uh, each story. Um, uh, but uh, visual artists, science fiction authors, and then experts from a, from a huge variety of fields. So we had, you know, data scientists, electrical engineers, sociologists, public policy analysts, science and technology studies, scholars like Gia and Angel, uh, public artists, architects, um, and then we were very lucky along with uh, Divya to have, to have uh, a number of great science fiction authors. So Paolo Bacigalupi, Deji Bryce Lukatun, and Andrew Hudson, um, all of whom are really stellar uh, acclaimed writers uh, who work in very different styles and genres as well, or subgenres, I guess. Um, and the goal of these narrative hackathons is to get people kind of oscillating between lots of activities and to be really generative of ideas and start doing some kind of collective world building about a vision of the near future, in this case, um, shaped and sort of focalized by a, a, a clean energy transition, a solar energy transition. And we, of course, we focused very specifically on cities. So uh, during these two days, we had folks oscillate between small group working time. The groups were maybe about a half dozen, uh, usually in size, people. Um, large group discussions and sharing. We would give the small groups tasks, different kind of world building um, sprints, we often call them within this narrative hackathon of giving them a really constrained period of time to accomplish a set of tasks and then report out to the large group. Uh, we had some talks and sort of mini lectures and big discussions. Um, here and there, a little bit of individual work time and then time for cross group feedback too, where we'd pair up the groups and have them um, give some input on, uh, on what people had come up with. So the idea is to really lean into and emphasize the social process of writing. You know, especially with fiction writing, I think there's like a mystique that it's like the work of a lone artist. This is true in academia in many cases too. The idea that like one genius is coming up with this incredible theory or great story in isolation. And of course that's never true. Uh, in a huge variety of ways, or it's very rarely true, in a huge variety of ways, um, people are drawing on uh, other people's work, uh, they're picking other people's brains, they're going on trips, they're doing ride-alongs with researchers or professionals in a field to learn about it. Um, and what these narrative hackathons do is they really emphasize and foreground that social process of generating a story and a sort of scenario for the future and exploring all of its nooks and crannies. Um, and you know what we hope, and, and we hope to do this even more with conversations like this on sort of the rollout of this book over the next little while, um, to bring this conversation to people, uh, a diverse group of people in terms of disciplines and fields of study, life experiences and social identities, but also geographic and cultural backgrounds as we've talked about quite a bit here. Uh, with renewable energy as with the climate crisis, like these are phenomena that are globe spanning, but they're also highly local. So like, uh, the geography of a solar energy transition or the geography of the climate crisis is going to look really different in San Antonio, Texas than it does in San Juan, Puerto Rico, than it's going to look in Chicago. The challenges and solutions are going to be really different. The risks are going to be different. Uh, the communities have really rich local histories. Um, so, so to expand from the methods, one thing I, I've been thinking about as everybody else has been talking is, is that the science fiction that comes out of these processes um, especially these solar energy ones. That, one thing that I've really prized about it is that it really traffics in the local, in the hyper-local and the specific, um, rather than the generalized global. When you think science fiction, you often think like travel to another planet or like big cyberpunk cities or sort of some sort of dystopian totalitarian rule that needs to get unseated by a group of plucky outsiders. And those are all sort of very like abstract stories that are um, meant to kind of resonate broadly to everyone uh, in some way. But um, just like we're all in a moment where we're realizing that our local news ecosystems have kind of degraded and that we don't have necessarily, we might have great national and global news outlets, but not like mechanisms for finding local news and really community specific um, information. With science fiction, you often see um, this zoom out uh, to the global, the national, to the uh, interplanetary. and. I think it's equally important and, and really creatively interesting to, uh, to, to go ahead and, and uh, 
invest in and, and sort of work on science fiction that looks really carefully at local problems, local solutions, um, that emphasizes communities, that looks really carefully at social geography, as so many of the essays in this volume uh, testify to. Because um, all of the resistance and struggle that we're going to need to change the energy system and make it more equitable is going to happen locally, even if it's networked globally. Um, so these are stories that hopefully help illuminate that. And the reason they're able to do that is because they come out of a collective intelligence of all of these different people. Um, and yeah, I hope we've created a, uh, a process that, that helps people think in different ways and give them time to explore ideas and bounce them off other people and that we end up with a more robust outcome because of it. Thanks, Joey. It's just been a, a great privilege over the last several years to work with Joey and Ruth and Ed and the others at the uh, on the team at the Center for Science and the Imagination, who uh, you know also do amazing things like uh, lay out books in really creative <laughs> ways and create websites at the drop of a hat and all of that. So thanks, Thank Joey, you. and thanks for everything you guys do to make these things possible. Um, I'm going to use the Q&A feature uh, on the webinar. So if you have questions, uh, please go ahead and uh, in, in, uh, enter them into the Q&A box at the bottom of the Zoom window. Uh, we have three already. And so long as we have a reasonable number, I'm just going to keep um, I'm just going to keep asking them and our panelists will answer them. And uh, obviously, if we start to get dozens or hundreds, that'll be fantastic. And maybe we'll uh, busy type away while other people are speaking and answer some of them online. But uh, please uh, send your questions our way. I'm gonna start with the first one uh, by Robert DeMorela at uh, the University of Delaware. Uh, and he says, thank you, Pat, Patty and Divya. I'm reminded listening to you on the value of traditional native knowledge systems to what extent did you consider these systems both as learning opportunities, but also how we can take elements of the same for building more sustainable and equitable cities? You want to go first? <laughs> sure. sure, I'll mention um, that, uh, so I was saying the, the main character is this uh, young woman in San Juan, and I mentioned in passing her girlfriend who is Yuisa, who is um, a native, uh, you know, descended from the indigenous population and is trying to set up a solar powered, self-sustaining community. And I think that was, um, and I think Gia can speak to this a little bit too, because we were talking about this in person at the time. That kind of drove, I think, this idea of incorporating um, native traditions of indigenous wisdom and making sure that uh, their ownership of the land and the way they interact with it and live in sustainable fashion kind of came into play and, and became a really integral part of the story because this is one of the conflicts for Tanama personally, you know, why she doesn't want to leave is she wants to stay and help her girlfriend with this initiative and, and make it succeed. Well, uh, talking about narratives, um, I think that people in power know very well that a, a good, simple narrative, you know, or for instance, what the solution is, the solution is to get more electric vehicles or to get just more solar, right? The, the ability to articulate a narrative is key in, 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 in the success powerful groups have to define what the future of the world is. That said, um, I also think that we have another, we also can use the power of narratives on, of images to articulate alternative options, alternative views of how, what the problem is and what the solutions are. And Therefore, I believe, uh, of course, numbers are also key, right? But I believe that, and that's something I learned from working with uh, indigenous communities whose uh, water was taken historically to serve the water needs of Mexico City. That I did that when I was a student. And with them, I learned, tell me a good story. I will tell you good stories. And uh, the power of listening to them 
really enticed me to realize how important narrative has, narratives are. So in terms of equity, I really think that what is in front of us, besides the need to have good technologies, is the need to imagine different worlds and to be able to create coalitions that allow us to get that imaginary, as we call it in Spanish, sorry for the translation, right? That imaginary to bear on the vision we have of alternative worlds. Because I also don't think that there will be one world. There are many worlds, many futures, and that's the beauty of human beings. And that's the beauty of Mother Earth, right? That we have a lot of diverse options. So, I really believe that we can use the same power of narratives and images, et cetera, and of art and of science to think of different worlds and to create a series of expectations for what is possible that are not there that we need to create. So yeah, that's something I learned and, 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 and that's something I enjoy a lot in this exercise with the group. They are already my partners in crime, in good crime, because there are good crimes and not so good crimes. <laughs> so that's, that's, my, that's my take at it. And um, I also have learned the hard way that we need to be humble about this journey and that it's only with the coming together of different groups uh, around a shared sense of possibility that we will be able to create a different world. And I know it's hard, it's ugly, but you know, things always start with dreams and, and why don't dreaming and coming together, for instance, around projects like this. Thanks. Um, our second question uh, is from Adauri Navarro Perez, who asks, uh, as people that experience these inequalities and energy transitions, what are some of the strategies that you utilize to write these realities that are so close to us uh, because we lived them. And so let me ask uh, uh, Angel and Gia perhaps to respond to that question. Um, okay, so as I uh, mentioned earlier, uh, we are not uh, distant or different for, for any other people. Uh, uh, like uh, if you, the, the numbers, the, the ones that are very distant are very few. Uh, the rest of, our, of, of us are uh, more like in terms of, let's say, uh, we can talk about the ultra wealthy people versus the ultra poor people. Uh, you know, the ultra poor are more, much more than the ultra wealthy. Uh, you can think about the ones who are uh, being displaced uh, are much more than the ones uh, who are not. And displacement comes in many uh, ways. But the thing is that uh, the key, that I mentioned was the sensibility, uh, how much you allow yourself uh, to be sensible uh, 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 to what you see out there. Uh, you, you can see a, a solar panel, but you can also see uh, some land being appropriated and some water being contaminated uh, somewhere else uh, in a distant place. Uh, so, it, it depends on, on how much you 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 want to dig uh, into that question. Uh, how much you dare to 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 sens sensitize yourself to that? Uh, the other question is is the well. There is also our part uh, in that, uh, which is well. We can continue living as we are, or we can do something about it. Uh, so that's my part on that. Um, thanks, Adauri, for your question. Um, I can share a little bit um, on how we constructed the story about 
San Juan and Puerto Rico, I think it will be helpful. Um, so we like in, when we were in the groups with the architects, with the experts, with the science fiction authors and with the artists, um, we use a lot like after we decide that we were doing San Juan, uh, we use utilize a lot my personal experience, I will say, in social struggle in Puerto Rico for, for the story that Divya wrote. And so that's why it's very well connected with the local names, local places, and local people. Also, we, we were inspired by multiple people in the island, especially the youth and multiple friends <laughs> that I have that have similar life uh, to this story, to, to the person in Panama in, in this story. Um, so I think that was that was very helpful that that I was there. So I was, I was able to share um, local information about the place. It's not always like that. So maybe uh, other school add about their experience on this. And also Divya had a great informed um, experiences with youth in India that she also included um, in, in when we were building this story. And, and I mean, I don't know if that exactly answered your question, but uh, yeah, it, I think it does. Um, but that's how we managed to include that. In. So. Thanks. Uh, Matt Fagan asks a, a great question. Uh, what does the energy transition look like when you take off the rose colored glasses? Uh, and of course, Matt knows me and knows that I uh, always approach the energy transition uh, through rose-colored glasses, uh, well, all right, so blue-colored glasses these days, because we all uh, have these computer, uh, specially attuned glasses for computers these days. But uh, the, the point being, uh, I think if I didn't, I would, um, uh, I would be unhappy all of the time. Uh, I do see opportunities. Uh, Matt says, in Clark's framing up front, there's the assumption that the energy transition is happening because of boardroom decisions in centers of power, ignoring how those same boardrooms have been the main delayers of the transition up until now. Related to this assumption is another about the vast opportunities uh, for choices about how to leverage this supposedly global beneficial energy transition. To give an analogy, it feels like uh, something like embracing multiculturalism as the minimal concession necessary to include difference in forms of economic, social, and political dominance. It's not that I'm not optimistic about social transformation of the possibility of futures built on the energy justice, but this justice has never come as a gift from the centers of power without sustained pressure from social struggle. Can you comment further on this? Thank you all so much for this presentation, really stimulating. I mean, it's a great uh, question and, and an important observation. And I think, uh, one of the things that we've learned doing this twice now uh, and, and generating four stories is uh, that one of the great um, <clears throat> features of narrative uh, storytelling uh, and science fiction uh, in particular is that even when you're trying to tell an optimistic story as uh, Divya does in things that bend but don't break. Um, stories are about struggle. Stories are about real people in real lives. And uh, stories are about overcoming hurdles. Uh, they're about the challenges uh, that people face uh, in trying to uh, accomplish those goals, whether those challenges are internal uh, or external. And I think that actually gives a great deal of uh, brings a great deal of realism. I mean, it may seem odd to say that about science fiction stories, uh, but it brings a lot more realism to our understanding of what it's going to take to achieve better futures uh, than the kinds of abstract, sterilized um, accounts that we often get in traditional forms of energy planning, uh, where everything is so abstracted away from the human experience. It's so focused on counting up the number of megawatts or gigawatts or terawatts that we have available to us and whether we're uh, balancing the supply and demand on the grid and whether uh, we can achieve some aggregate least 
cost on average uh, system in an optimized kind of sense. And so <clears throat> I think when you, when you force people to tell stories, uh, and you, you, you force people to engage in thinking about real people in real circumstances. And, and actually it has disturbed, I think, a lot of the uh, engineers who've participated in these exercises uh, to find that we're telling stories about solar energy and renewable energy that are not uh, utopian optimistic stories. Uh, in in a narrow kind of sense, uh, like they're comfortable with and familiar with uh, from trying to advocate for solar energy, uh, many of them, for example, over the last uh, 30 years. So, so I think the, that that's an important part of what we uh, try to accomplish in the book is to is to center that struggle. And, and I suppose I might reframe my argument about choices uh, to say that, you know, these are obviously not choices that are going to be um, ones where we sit down in some kumbaya moment and, and collectively say, well, what are we going to do? Um, they're they're going to be choices that are going to result from fights over how uh, we design the energy systems and their social relationships of the future. Uh, but what I really find powerful about this approach is that it opens up the imagination of the possibilities that we might fight for. Mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, I think it opens up the imaginations of those uh, that are in positions of power um, to recognize that there isn't just one approach uh, or one answer as to what the technology should look like in the future. There are different ways of doing this um, and that they need to take those different possibilities seriously and perhaps, and I, it's a serious perhaps, uh, it opens them up to the possibility that they might accommodate uh, a different set of values, a different set of concerns uh, in the design of those futures. So I am optimistic about that, uh, but only uh, if we continue to push really, really hard to get an optimistic future. Um, but I, welcome others to contribute to that from the panel as well. I, I wanted to just add, and, and Matt, thank you for that question, um, that you know we didn't ask for this, uh, uh, Clark and our prompting I, for the, for the narrative hackathon, but like all of these stories do have a kind of what I would call like a community of opposition or a community of resistance at the center of them. So it's certainly true in Divya's story with the Granha, the sort of off the grid community at the center of the story. But then it's true of the other three stories to a greater or lesser extent too. There's these sort of like fractious political groups or coalitions. They're often in opposition, uh, you know, maybe not like it's not like violent opposition, but they're, they're in sort of institutional and political opposition to a power company or a local government um, or a landlord. Um, in, in, in most cases, these stories tended, I think, to gravitate towards people trying to uh, achieve some sorts of uh, cultural responsiveness and energy autonomy. Uh, I, I think in some ways, like the stories are about small examples, small glimmers of hope, um, examples that could, in theory, be replicated elsewhere. Uh, there isn't necessarily a story in this book. The Chicago one gets the closest uh, that that proposes like a solution that could that could necessarily quickly scale. Um, I think it would have to be something that would grow like a movement, and that's what you see in in uh, the Puerto Rico story is, is 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 a local example that could speciate out into into different places and would have to be adapted. Um, but it was actually striking in response to Matt, like that we didn't necessarily set the board up to ask for stories about these like sort of community level um, self-organized struggles. Um, but that is that is where all of the groups gravitated towards. And that's one of the power, that's, that's one of the powerful things about doing the, um, the book the way that we did with this, with this uh, narrative hackathon workshop and having everybody in the room. We were very lucky to be able to do that before the pandemic is that you do sometimes get, I think, a uh, uh, a, a sort of vibe in the room or a zeitgeist in the room of like, this is kind of like uh, the direction everybody's drifting with their stories and the stories end up being quite a bit um, more in dialogue with, with each other than if they were commissioned totally separately. I, I also want to add that 
I think that we need different approaches to tackle this. It's important to have numbers, right? We need to have a sense of what we need, how many solar panels we need. Uh, we need to have some way to uh, simplify reality in order to get a sense of where to start. That said, what I like about a, 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 the approach we took to this book is that, for instance, besides <clears throat> having these communities that resist, we were able to understand that the transitions will be messy, not least because we will have many actors involved uh, with different positions and interests and stakes, but also because within each of us, there is a, a bunch of <clears throat> values, identities, feelings, and loyalties that are deeply intertwined within our actions. Meaning we, I mean, and this is something I keep telling particularly to enge some engineers and some economists, not all, that <clears throat> actions are not rational in terms of, oh, well, I'm maximizing a function, but <clears throat> they, they have a rational that is this combination of feelings and identities and fears and et cetera. And that's why it is also hard to deal with humans, right? That's why it is so hard to model us, right? We, we create scenarios, we create stories, we create backcasting because we know that uh, those are ways for us to get our hands around the complexity of human nature. And I think that storytelling, that art, that other forms of imagination are key for us to get a sense of our very human nature, our very contradictory and nuanced uh, human nature and how we need to engage with it if we really want to understand what is needed to move from point A to point B. And I am not again to decide where those points are. We will do it as collectives with struggles, fights, competition, cooperation, and all what defines human beings. Thanks, Patty. I think that's a really great answer. Um, I'm gonna uh, pass, I apologize, Siddharth, uh, on the opportunity to read a little bit uh, of the story just in the interest of uh, time. I do encourage you all to download a copy of the book and, uh, and take a read for yourselves. Um, and Patty, I'm gonna ask you if you might tackle the next question uh, from an, an anonymous attendee. How would this collaboration between the transition to a solar energy system and people from all walks of life connect with the field of city planning, especially when it comes to environmental justice. And it just seems like, you know, with the work that the Manquato Institute is doing, how do we put this into practice when we're thinking about the future of cities? Well, that's, that's a really <laughs> hard to answer question. Uh, I, in my experience, in my humble experience, uh, I have seen different approaches urban planners take to addressing different constituencies, different needs um, when dealing with innovations and energy innovations are part of this. There is this inclusive way whereby there is a real effort by different stakeholders. And I have seen that, for instance, in Manizales and in some uh, rural communities, well, this are not urban, but it's rural communities of Mexico, whereby there is a real intent to get everyone at the table and together decide what the problem, what the trade-offs, what the solutions are. And this is not exempt from conflict. I want to say conflict is part of decision-making. The thing is how we get our hands around it and how we really listen and navigate and negotiate differences. So I have seen good experiences of being inclusive and seeing particularly underrepresented groups as part of the solution, in which case they really feel empowered and they are really willing to, to engage in whatever sacrifices needed to achieve the goals they define. But I also have seen experiences where there is a lot of arrogance uh, uh, among decision makers or academics, we tend to be arrogant, I need to say. And, and, and that really just, uh, you know, people go blank and they don't pay attention to you. You know, you come with arrogance to say, hey, this is what we will do and guess what? You'll get resistance. And, and this is similar to having children. 
tell your children you need to clean because I said so, guess what? They won't clean, even if you said so. But if you engage with them in a more, you know, like, hey, let's, let's do it together. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I screwed it up today. Sorry for the expression, right? So, I mean, again, I have seen in collectives ex examples of really inclusive approaches that as far as it concerns me, have been more successful than those where the, the, the ideas and the solutions and even the problems and the solutions from, come from the top, boom, put on people. Uh, and, and I think we need to learn from those experiences and those cannot be captured with numbers. They need to capture with ethnography, with stories and with other tools um, for us to learn from what works and does not work. Um, and again, uh, one last point. I don't know whether we will be able to be completely equal and completely just and completely right. But I think that we will be, we can be able to be as inclusive, as equal and as just as possible. And I think it is possible because there are examples of that. How to scale that up? Guys, that's why I'm here with you to work together on the experiment and see how we can do it together because I have learned to be humble about the challenge. Thanks, Patty. I think one of the things um, that <clears throat> I learned uh, many years ago from my colleague, Elisa Graffi, uh, who uh, was working with us as part of a um, conversation about Arizona's energy future that we were having, uh, uh, that was nearly a decade ago now, uh, is that stories, and I don't want to say particularly these stories necessarily, but storytelling as a modality is actually something that opens up conversations about things like energy uh, or things like urban futures uh, to people who uh, aren't ordinarily, a, uh, don't feel ordinarily able to participate in those conversations because they don't have the jargon, they don't have the analytics, uh, they, they, they don't feel like they're authorized to speak to uh, questions of energy system design, for example, um, but they uh, are delighted to participate and tell stories about their experiences uh, and to share those stories uh, about their histories um, and about what happens to them and about how they feel about things. And so uh, I think storytelling is a kind of opportunity um, to take more planning oriented methodologies and, uh, and create spaces within which other groups can effectively feel that they can participate, make contributions that are valuable and then have those converse contributions reflected uh, in, in the process. Uh, and so I, I do think we're, we need to see more opportunities to think through stories. Uh, the next question, uh, Divya and Gia, maybe I'll ask you to uh, talk a little bit about the, the process inside the, the working group uh, and how, as you're writing these stories, the, the back and forth between uh, the different forms of, of expertise and the, and the different forms of creativity in the process work? Yeah, sure, I'll, I'll, I guess I'll start. So I'm gonna roll back just for a second because I want to uh, raise a point from that first discussion where you know, we were talking about the similarities and sort of the, the zeitgeist in the room. Um, Science fiction, especially modern current science fiction, definitely has a tendency to be anti-authoritarian and highly individualistic, but also trying these days very much to speak truth to power, especially as more people of color, queer people, um, you know, people that are neurodivergent of differing physical abilities have started participating in these sort of narrative conversations through fiction, there has been much more of this attempt to, um, rather than center stories around people with authority, to center them around the people 
who are struggling for autonomy and power. And there's two uh, words to look up for the people in the audience if you're not familiar with it, that are counterpoints to the traditional cyberpunk, which are hope punk and solar punk. And hope punk, you know, as the name indicates, is largely for the sort of optimistic visions of the future that are empowering people and provide more social justice. And solar punk is specifically looking at climate change and environment and stories that show positive outcomes for both of those. And so all of this was definitely, you know, in the forefront of my mind and possibly of the other three authors as well when sitting down and, and trying to craft the story because as an author, especially my personal process is usually to have an idea and then to have a character and the character really ends up driving the plot. And that's where I think it got very collaborative, especially with Chia in terms of who are we building the story around? You know, what is her life like? What are her central problems? And what are the potential technological solutions that are available to her that will empower her and her friends and her family in a positive way? Gia, you wanna, you wanna speak a little bit about, you know, uh, your side of things? And then I yeah, can jump back in. Sure. Um... So I, I think like all of the people that were working on the story uh, wanted to this to result in something very me meaningful um, to to the to what we were doing to the authors to the group to the academia but also to the people that we were talking about to the places that we were talking about or, or thinking about it and so we also wanted to be very inclusive with all our opinions there and. We were actually very different among us, very, very different and different level of careers. And Angel and I, for example, we were a student. There were other people that that Divya that had um, this career on writing stories and books and the artists. So um, I don't know, we have a really good vibe, I will say, in the small group. And we were able to actually understand each other. And if we had question, we was like, what was that? Like, what is exactly that? Because we didn't understand everything because we come from different areas of our expertise. Um, but what we do have in common, it was that, that feeling and that uh, intention to actually make this stories and essays um, worth it and, and meaningful. So I think that was that was very helpful and yeah. I uh, also want to mention um, since they were specifically asked also about certain technological elements and how that mm -hmm. affects the society. Um, one of the members of our group, uh, Rob, is part of the Land Art Initiative, mm -hmm. which was you know brought a lot of really interesting ideas to the table, uh, literally and figuratively, in terms of. Um, you know, weaving in art and beauty along with uh, practical aspects of solar technology. And so we had, that ended up uh, kind of pushing the story in certain directions and really driving a lot of the details in the story, like uh, this famous Puerto Rican artist who had gone um, to the US and specifically worked in solar art installations, right? And so she's kind of a, a hero for the people there, but also more locally, like um, uh, Tanama's grandmother putting, you know, solar fabric on the outside of her farmland, right? I think this guy, I think came from talking to you about what the rural areas are like um, around the island and what people might do to beautify their surroundings uh, in a way that's practical. So that was one way that technology kind of helped drive some of the, the details of the story setting. Thanks, you two, that really nice. Um, let me just add, uh, because I think it's an important part of the book, but it often gets a little bit less attention um, that uh, I think one of the pieces of the of the methodology uh, that I really like is that the collaborations in the teams do a lot of world building activities, uh, and so there's a there's often a richer world behind each of these stories than 
uh, than is accessible in a short story because you can only do so much in, in, a, in a short story. And the, the fact that the book contains a set of, of essays uh, and art in conjunction with the story allows for people to explore some of those different elements. And so, uh, for example, the uh, Divya mentioned Robert Ferry, uh, who works at the Land Art Generator Initiative, which Joey has put the link uh, in the chat. Um, he was super fascinated with some of these different possible ways that you could use and, and do solar technologies. Uh, and he wrote about those in his essay. And so you can go and have a look and, and see some of those technologies there. And I think it gives um, a, a way not only to explore a little bit more fully the worlds in which these stories are set, uh, but also to bring uh, into the dialogue some of the different perspectives that you see from the people who are more technology centric from the critical social scientists in the collaboration. Uh, and so, so I really encourage you don't just read the stories, although start with the stories because they're the gems uh, of the book, but, but then take a look at some of the other essays that accompany them uh, and, and, and see how they kind of fill out the, the conversation in, in, an, in an interesting way. We've got one uh, more question from Norwell Hines. Uh, he says, I suppose a crisis for imaginaries is the question of who is imagining and their relative power. Uh, the future is disruptive to social systems. Communities, particularly indigenous communities, may not have the power to respond with their own imagination or sense of the future. Do you find in this methodology of storytelling on energy transition imaginaries that it's necessary to take a position to endorse a particular philosophy, seemingly indigenous or Afrocentric philosophies, which run counter to uh, the dominant Eurocentric views. So maybe let me turn to uh, Patty and Divya to offer uh, a commentary on uh, kind of how to think about these larger questions of, of imagination and how it gets structured by different forms of writing and different possibilities. Right, well, uh, I mean, in my experience, Sadly, uh, when I was still a student and I tried to work with the communities affected by these water projects, no matter how powerful the narratives we created, we were, we didn't make it, you know, like they gathered their water and their land taken away from them. Um, but I have learned that there are other ways, I mean, that we need, really need to look for other political ways to get the, those voices taken care of. Uh, not because the power of the narratives these communities create is not uh, amazing. It's just because of how power is structured in society. Uh, so I really think that uh, that's where I'm talking about coalition building and how, um, like uh, we need to work together or to mobilize, to fight hard, to make sure those narratives and voices are, are taken care of. And that's not happening. Uh, no, and sadly, that's not happening no matter how powerful their narratives and their way of looking at the work and their cosmovision. Um, so perhaps that's, I, I send that back to you, Clark. Perhaps we can create another project and its goal will be not only to engage in these exercises, but to make sure that key communities uh, that are suffering from fracking, from um, uh, tar sands and from all these developments, right? Uh, are able to, to come together or, uh, to um, get empowered, we empower with them, et cetera, to, to create these other voices and in the process, create these coalitions that are as important as the narratives, right? To, to, to really change the conversation. But I, I really need to be humble about how hard it is, you know? <laughs> I wish it was easy. Yeah. <laughs> Divya, do you have last thoughts? 
about that? Yeah, I'll, I'll kind of go back to that uh, seeing is believing. And I, I totally feel Patty on, you know, the practical challenges of moving from fictional narratives to, you know, immediate social change, right? Because how do you, you can't break down the power structures just from telling a good story. However, I will say that the collective consciousness of society, if they see certain story elements over and over again, it starts to shape the way they think and what they believe is possible, but even in terms of what they value morally, ethically, and socially. And I'll give the example that's sometimes cited, and these are hard things to measure in any real scientific way, but um, when Barack Obama was elected president of the US, people pointed to the fact that you know Morgan Freeman and I forget the name of the actor, but the, the actor who plays the US president in the show 24, that Hollywood had created these very, very popular uh, narratives that a lot of people watched in which the president of the United States was a black man and he was an effective president. And that these kinds of stories, when they can reach a wide, wide audience, right? When they're very, very popular, that again creates this sort of <clears throat> unconscious collective acceptance that oh this is okay this type of situation will be fine because we've seen it happen we know how it's going to play out and so when it um when the uh when the reality kind of uh, offers itself to people as a potential they have a very concrete vision of how it can actually act actualize and they have hopefully then less fear in terms of moving forward in that particular direction. So unfortunately, you know, the stories that are in uh, Weight of Light and Cities and Light are not necessarily yet in Hollywood, but that is a very, very powerful place for storytelling where if, you know, we could get people from there interested in bringing some of these types of stories to a much wider audience, I think we have the potential to take narratives and philosophies that are outside the Western traditions and um, make them acceptable and uh, realistic to a very, very broad audience. Thanks, uh, Divya, and um, thanks everyone. I think what you're pointing to is uh, precisely the challenge, and Joey and I have talked about this over the years, of what we kind of see as the second uh, stage of this overall project, uh, especially I think now that we've done two of these and we've demonstrated that you can do the creative generativity uh, of building stories, but the real uh, part two is to get the stories out into conversations uh, and have those conversations occurring about what kinds of futures might be possible uh, in particular places uh, and uh, in more broadly across whole regions or even uh, countries. And uh, that one we haven't figured out yet, uh, but we're uh, still thinking about it. And of course, we're also looking for opportunities. And so if any of you out there in the audience have ideas about how to uh, move forward the dialogue and conversation uh, around imagination and stories uh, about the future of energy. Uh, we'd be delighted to have a conversation with you about them. And uh, thank you again so much for joining us today. Uh, and thank you especially Angel, Joey, Gia, Divya, uh, and Patty for participating as panelists uh, in, in today's conversation. I really appreciate it. What a, what a wonderful conversation about the future of cities uh, and the future of light. Take care, everybody. <laughs>